Module 5, Selecting and Prioritizing Interventions. The objective of this module is to identify direct safe system pillar interventions plus enabling interventions, assessing relative ease of implementability, prioritizing actions, and identifying activities necessary to achieve actions. Mr. Howard will start Module 5. What I want to talk about fairly quickly in this session are these things. What are the key basic interventions? And you, you'll all know those pretty well. What, what are the real starting points for things that we do? But what about the enabling interventions, the things that we have to put in place if we're going to do something out in the field? Those enabling interventions. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Selecting direct interventions. Enforcing helmets, treating black spots, what I call direct interventions that are, again, what we think of when we talk about interventions, but are not possible unless the enabling arrangements have been put in place, the legislation, the uh, guidelines in road authorities and so on. A little bit about ease of implementability, you know, let's do what we can. Road safety is above all else, the art of the possible. What can we get in place today? What can we implement today? Tomorrow we can build on that, and the year after, and so on. If we wait for the perfect solution, or we wait for a much broader solution, we might wait 10 or 20 years. And I know from experience, so often you'll get well-intentioned legislative people coming to you and saying, well, you want to do this, but why don't we add this on, because that would really be more logical. And I would say to them, please go away. I want to just solve this problem. If I add this on, there'll be a whole lot of other interests that will oppose what we're trying to do. So implementability is really crucial. And, and those of you involved in trying to get matters through the, your parliaments and through your governments know that. It's got to be implementable. Keep it simple as you can. Deal with what you can get in place and leave it to another day to build on it. Prioritising actions. One. One school of thought would say you have to focus on the things that will save the most lives. Well, ideally, yes, but that isn't the way to go. That you should prioritise the things that you know you can do. Get through the parliament, get through the agencies, get agreement from everybody to do the things you know you can achieve. It's a very important message, I think. We need to be able to do the things we can. And then the more, the, perhaps the things the things that are more substantial will follow later. Go for that low-hanging fruit because everybody wins when you deliver something, no matter if it's a smaller benefit. If you can say to your politicians, look, we've put these things in place this year. We want to do this, but we've put these in place. The community's happy with that. Progress is being made. You've demonstrated a capacity to deliver and you build confidence amongst your chief executives and your politicians. A simple action might have a hundred activities associated with it. It's never simple, is it? So always have a mind to all of the steps you're going to have to go through to get an action in place. And there can be a lot of activities. And if you don't do that, you, you, it's like being in the dark. You're going along and thinking, well, what's going to come out and hit me next? What's going to clobber me next? Think, plan ahead. Write down the activities and think about how you're going to deal with those activities, how you're going to deliver them. It'll serve you well. Some key basic interventions. These are the, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of road safety. Well, you know these as, as well as I do. Um, there's the infrastructure stuff, the signage and line markings, the uh, roadside access control, a big problem in ASEAN countries. You know, road authorities ought to have the right to say to local governments and land use planning authorities, if you're going to develop that property, great, but here are our requirements for how those vehicles are going to enter the road reserve. You're going to have to build a service road, one access every 500 metres, something like that, with traffic lights. They're the sorts of big shifts in thinking we have to get societies in this part of the world to move towards. Because I'll just throw this in at this point, I'll come back to this theme later. You are in the public sector reform business. It's road safety, but this is a multi-sectoral activity you're involved in. And the more successful you are, the more you are reforming your public sector. 
And road safety is one of the most powerful means to reform public sectors in countries because it needs whole of government activity, it needs procedures, established procedures between levels of the bureaucracy, good linkage with the political system. And if I can give you this little example, if you look at this, there's an organisation called Transparency International, it has nothing to do with road safety, but Transparency International, and, and it ranks countries on their transparency and governance and uh, you know, quality of, uh, of uh, operation of those societies and their laws and respect for rule of law and so on. If you look at the top 30, it ranks every country in the world. If you look at the top 32 countries out of the 180 countries, 26 of the best road safety performers are within that 32 countries. So good road safety requires good governance. And, and don't, be, don't be fearful of that. But I mention it because you are in the public sector reform business. You will strike many challenges, many difficulties, because multi-sectoral cooperation is difficult to achieve. You will run up against a number of obstacles. Many in this room know that. Don't be deterred by that. Be aware of it. Please be aware of it. And recognise that by bringing as many of your colleagues with you as you can across the agencies, getting the community aware of what you're doing, you're not only improving road safety, you are improving the quality of governance of your country. Setting safe speed limits. Ben, that's the other thing you can do. I should have mentioned that too. If you've got a very congested linear urban development, then you can't have traffic travelling at 60 kilometres an hour. It's got to drop down to 30 because you've got lots of pedestrians and accesses and so on. And the problem politically is that that creates pressure on the politicians. Why am I driving so slowly here when I want to get to somewhere quickly? Well, the only way you're going to get there more quickly is a, a, a freeway or a motorway that's built uh, somewhere else. So these are very, very difficult issues. And of course, you've got to have good public transport to take the pressure off the roads. There are no easy answers. But ignoring the safety outcomes is not a solution. That's why we have the deaths and serious injuries that we have today. The safety solution, the sa safety has been squeezed out by the need to put food on the table, the very basic need to make a living, we understand that. But ASEAN is now getting to the point where we have to start addressing the safety implications of that. Safer vehicles for two-wheelers. There are lots of things we can do with two-wheelers. Helmet wearing we've talked about. Electronic brake assist. I'm told that this new technology for motorbikes is very, very good in terms of presenting, uh, preventing or reducing the likelihood of losing control going around curves. It's a bit of technology that sits on the bike and controls the, the torque of the wheel, all of uh, technical issues that I don't fully understand. But it's available. Probably not a big cost to go on bikes. It needs to be on the agenda. And if you try and apply safe system thinking to two-wheelers, there's two, two points I'd make. Firstly, the two-wheelers shouldn't be travelling at more than 40 kilometres an hour anywhere, because if you come off a two-wheeler at more than 40 k's, you'll probably be killed. But secondly, and much more, I'm not saying this can be done, but let's go back to the reality of safe system. If you're on a motorbike sharing the road with other vehicles, those other vehicles shouldn't be travelling at more than 40 k's. Now think of what would, think of the problems of implementing that. They're quite massive. And there'll be some places where you can do that in urban areas, but clearly on higher speed roads, we've got to find ways, as Malaysia is doing and has done, to get the motorbikes out of the traffic lanes into their own lanes. And uh, Jog Jakarta has a ring road where slow vehicles go out on the left-hand carriageway with a little separator strip. There are many, th I'm sure other countries are doing things. But motorbikes should not be mixing with vehicles, as a principle, should not be mixing with vehicles doing more than 40 kilometres an hour. And you could, you could tell us quite a bit about your own experience in, in Malaysia with that. EBA is electronic brake assist. Electronic Brake Assist, EBA, and it's, it's a, a torque controller on motorbikes, new technology, that's a great way of preventing a lot of the bike loss of control on curves. Again, other key basic interventions, the bread and butter stuff of road safety. F safer users, compliance with helmet and seat belt wearing, with speed limits, with alcohol limits, traffic signals, pedestrian crossing rules. Uh, operating lights at night on trucks, the back of trucks. But pedestrian crossings, 
I think in many parts of ASEAN, in the cities, every pedestrian crossing should have a platform, in my view, because the platform is a strong message to drivers that they must slow down to the speed limit of 30, 30 kilometres an hour or whatever. And it really isn't a big impost on drivers if it's properly designed. I don't mean a speed bump, I mean a, a platform. Because you, you then introduce a vertical element into the roadway that drivers can actually see. But trying to see a bit of paint on the road in advance is very, very difficult. Licence testing is a big issue for ASEAN too. You've, 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 we've got to get our licence testing standards up because that's the protection for young people getting onto the road. And you all know there are many unlicensed riders out there particularly who've never been through a test, haven't even got a licence. So that's good. There are things to be done. Post-crash care good ambulance services, and, that, and each of you will strengthen your ambulance services in the years ahead continuously. That's a good thing. I know some countries now where, you know, pick up the victims first, get them to hospital, sort out financial issues later. That's happening in a number of ASEAN countries. Now, this, this is good. As ASEAN's prosperity is going up, capacity to do these things is increasing. It's an exciting time for this part of the world. Getting people to hospital quickly, a good injury insurance system. There are some good models in ASEAN, very good models, and um, I think there are great opportunities with the injury insurers to reinvest in the road system to make it safer so that their claims will come down. And the tantalising prospect is you can invest in reducing the number of crashes if you're an insurer and get a commercial return from it. The challenge is for us to come up with the business cases that will let them do that. Let's talk then about some of these enabling interventions, the, the sort of things you've got to do to make other things possible. And there's the, the hidden interventions, if you like, in road safety. We talked about the road safety management framework yesterday, really important. That, that's your underpinning, and you'll get that in place, you'll build on what you have, strengthen it over the next five years, it will serve you well. And you'll find ways to push that from the model I, look, I put up there yesterday. It's got to suit your needs, but that's, that's fundamental. You need a good crash data system. Make sure you get a good crash data system. Adequate penalties. You need good deterrence. We talked a bit about this yesterday in licensing. And some more enabling interventions. You've got to have road authority rules. Um, I, I know there's worries about you know petty corruption and so on, but you've just got to be prepared to temper that petty corruption over time. You can't change a culture overnight. It's indeed how most families in many countries have survived. But you've got to find ways to temper that over time as, as rates of pay increase and improve. Look at diminishing the impact upon, um, upon enforcement outcomes. Police equipment and training, subsidies for helmets. We talked about that yesterday. How do you get helmet programs in place for disadvantaged groups? More enabling interventions. Uh, digital license systems, data systems, the vehicle and offence systems. I talked about that. Good practice, new vehicle standards. Getting industry and government to agree, that this is the operators of heavy vehicles, getting them to agree with government what they're going to do to clean up their act to stop the overloading, the gross overloading anyway, to make their vehicles more compliant, to actually put their vehicles through the regular testing genuinely and not just paying money to get a piece of paper and avoiding the process. These are critical issues that you can't solve overnight. But you all know that they're things that need to be tackled. And the important thing is to make a start. Plan to have some discussion about what it is you're going to do. Public bus operations, a lot of you have problems with your bus systems and I know some countries are moving to do things. Again, complex operation, big reform agenda. And of course, buses speeding is a hell of a problem in a lot of countries. Big problem, you know. The, the economic incentives are there for them to speed, to get more passengers, get do it more quickly, make some more money. There have to be some thoughtful ways of putting safety incentives in place to counter those economic incentives. These are the good UN good practice manuals. Uh, I've talked about the speed manual yesterday. This is seat belts and child restraints, drinking and driving, pedestrian safety and helmets. And, and they're really helpful. 
they're helpful how-to manuals, and if you haven't got them, or haven't seen them, please access them on the GRSP website. So this will be very important for you in your role as train in training others to have this sort of material. It's really helpful. It'll be very helpful for others you're talking with. Okay, so I've talked about enabling interventions. Let's talk now about direct interventions, which is, you know, the things we actually go out and do out in the field. And I'd suggest you need to look at implementation issues and screen in the ones that you, can, you feel you can make progress on more quickly. And I'd suggest you need to look at implementation issues and screen in the ones that you, can, you feel you can make progress on more quickly. And the OECD work back in 2008, we talked about this report yesterday. This report, the Towards Zero report, OECD 2008, identified building block interventions. So it looked at what are the, what are the basic interventions that we, we would sort of suggest you focus on initially. Well, here they are. That's, this is out of the report. Safer speeds, reducing... This, this came out of surveys of all the OECD countries. Uh, safer speeds, drink driving, increased seat belt and helmet use, better road and roadside infrastructure, promoting safer vehicles. Promoting safer vehicles, that's, that's a consumer awareness one. Graduated licensing of drivers, and the implication there is let's make sure they're licensed anyway. Improving the safety of pedestrians, cyclists and two-wheelers, the vulnerable road user problem, which in most of ASEAN is 60 to 75% of the deaths that you have, two-wheelers and pedestrians, some cyclists. And improving the medical management of people after crashes. It's a pretty logical list, isn't it? The sort of things we would naturally tend to look to do. If we look at safer vehicles, promoting safety to consumers. And this is very important, a very important step for ASEAN. And this, this should grow and be expanded. Some countries may want to run their own NCAP tests, but N, NCAP stands for New Car Assessment Program. How safe are cars? One, two, three, four, five star. You can buy cars in the Australian market. You can buy cars that are only one star. You can buy two star, three star, four star, five star. Your chances of being killed in a vehicle, in any crash, tend to reduce by half for each additional star. So why would you ever buy a one-star car? And consumers vote with their wallets, and they're paying that little extra premium in many countries for the three, four, and five-star car. The direct safe system pillar interventions, assuming your enablers are in place, and that's a big if, um, You've got to look at whether they're implementable, are they material, and can all the agencies help in putting them together? Because you've got to have these things at the bottom in place, but if all the agencies are involved, it's giving a greater power and strength at political level, because all those ministers will be getting the same briefing. It's very important. And if you've got a cabinet meeting, you've got three ministers who are all going to vote for something, that's a pretty good start. So get, get the, get, don't try and do it as an agency yourself. Get your, even if you're doing most of the work on an intervention, get your other partners fully involved as well and see how they can help. But to me, this is the key issue. You might have an, you might have a, an intervention that's probably only going to affect 2 or 3% of the road toll, of the, the num number of deaths. doesn't matter. If you, can get it, you think you can get it in place reasonably, in a reasonably straightforward way, and they never are, but a reasonably straightforward way, you go and do it. Go and do it. Build a track record of delivering, and your credibility increases. Helmet and seatbelt wearing enforcement, you know all about that. Speed compliance enforcement, especially for buses and especially for motorcycles. Drink driving enforcement, heavy vehicle and bus operation enforcement. Uh, I talked about on-road safety for two-wheelers can't ignore that. Uh, ped safety and, and more footpaths. Unsafe overtaking is a big problem, again for buses and for trucks. And you know the tendency of trucks and buses to overtake, and the poor old motorcyclist coming towards them just gets driven off the road. That's an enforcement issue and a confiscation of a bus or a truck would very quickly change that behaviour. But that's a big shift in the culture, but it can be changed very quickly.
ease of implementability, I think you understand that concept. Safety retrofitting on roads for two wheelers and pedestrians. Where, where can you get the money from? We'll talk about funding later today. Funding is just crucial. Funding is much easier to argue for when you've got good arguments, good data, good business cases for investment. Those business cases help you make the case for more funding. It's difficult to go and say, I want more funding generally. Very difficult. But you have to build that up showed yesterday, I think, some activity plans for actions. You know, the, even the simplest action will be complicated. And the one I just talked about with that agency where I suggested the seatbelts is an example. That, to me, that should have been something they could have done relatively straight away. Multi-agency technical working groups are a powerful way to bring together road safety expertise and focus on a problem. And we talked about that yesterday in the diagrams, but this is a way to get all the agencies involved in supporting a measure. And remember that if you have the agencies all involved, you get a greater shield of political support for an initiative. If you have the agencies all involved, you get a greater shield of political support for an initiative. Selecting and prioritising interventions, you can read that in the notes. There's lots of tools available like IRAP and other things. 